Welcome to the FA Football Forum. This podcast episode was from a series delivered back in 2020 to help support grassroots clubs and leagues. This was delivered on a webinar platform and therefore may not make too much sense unless you've got the documentation to hand, all of which is available within the description below. With this being delivered during lockdown, sometimes the audio quality may differ. Please bear that in mind. But as always, if you've got any questions or you've got any inquiries in particular to this episode or any other episode, please reach out to us by emailing clubsprogram at the fa.com. You are all here this evening, uh, hopefully, for the webinar on common unity, but more so looking um, not at this slide. Uh, this slide was a week late, so uh, that just shows that between myself and Russ, we've looked at this presentation many a times and we didn't notice this absolute schoolboy error. So you are here this evening to hopefully not be on this webinar, but to look at educational establishments and institutes and the power that they can bring to your club, league or organisation. And it is today on Wednesday, the 17th of June and not Wednesday, the 10th of June. So so, uh, well, guys, well done to you guys for uh, being on the right webinar. So, who is this uh, individual speaking to this evening? If I haven't um, introduced myself virtually already on one of these webinars, uh, nice to meet you all. My name is Danielle Wards. I'm the National Club Services Manager here at the Football Association. Um, throughout the webinar series uh, and throughout the webinar this evening, if you do have any questions, please do pop them in the chat. If there's anything that's outside the scope of this uh, presentation this evening, you'd like to ask me a question, please don't hesitate to email clubsprogram at the fa.com and I'll be able to help you with any questions you may have. Alternatively, you do have your local county FA that are fantastic. So please do drop them an email um, if there is any further questions or any other topics that you would like to discuss that, like I say, is outside the scope of this webinar this evening. So a small little bit of housekeeping, mentioned a few things already there, but please do make sure that your microphones are muted. The webinar will be recorded and you will be able to catch up at your own leisure. The slides will also be emailed to yourselves as well as any kind of additional resources or content that we assign uh, alongside the webinar. And any questions that you have throughout the presentation, please keep yourselves muted until the end um, and uh, we will be able to answer any questions you have. So just pop them in the chat so I can begin to populate them throughout the webinar series this evening and then look to share them with Russ and our additional special guests. So just a quick recap of the webinars that we have covered to date. So they are all there for you. I'm not going to go into each and every one of them. But if for whatever reason you have missed one of them um, topics, please do again email clubsprogram at the fa.com and I'll be able to share all the relevant information. Alternatively, bottom right hand side is a link to our clubs and leagues dedicated page on the fa.com that has a whole host of additional resources and information. So today is not the second part, but today is the third part of a four part series. Uh, and tonight we will be looking at the relationships, education and institutes, which was um, off the back of looking at the power of your local network and individual skills. Um, originally started off by looking at community as a whole and finishing next week on the 24th of June, looking at places, spaces and faces. So that wider community development. So. I did mention that uh, we have Russ here this evening. So, Russ, if you'd like to uh, say hello. Evening all. Uh, for those who have rejoined us, thank you. For those who have thought, did the ball cross the line or not? Um, feel free to still ponder that because the watch didn't work. And for those who are new, uh, hiya, my name's Russ Smith. Um, I work, or I've worked predominantly for 20 years in community, whether it be coaching, sport development, um, a range of things on a well, kind of a wide range of stuff, really. So I've worked for the FA really for 15 years in partnership on a range of stuff. I'm a current committee member of a league, which is called the Stairbridge District League uh, here in the Black Country. Uh, and a lot of my work really has been all about community and the power that football can have, really. And part of this webinar series is sharing best practice me giving you a bit of insight and knowledge that I know and has helped me in my career, um, but also, you know, other football clubs sharing and looking at what they can do for you guys to have some ideas post-COVID 
as we're now starting to get you know our kids back involved there's going to be a bigger wider need for that wider community development as we go and we'll go to our next slide because we've got some guests with us tonight um so we've got a couple of clubs for sharing with us um so tom finney which is based up in uh preston uh charlotte's from the university of portsmouth um, we have a little bit with uh, a policeman, Dave, who's back in my patch in Smethwick, about how they've used football to make a difference. And the key bit really is tonight is we're going to split education institutes up a little bit. So our first bit of share will be about using and linking football with education establishments. Then we'll have a little opportunity for some questions if you want to, after some presentations from our partner clubs as well. Then I'll just retouch base back on institutions as the wider series. Uh, we've already covered a little bit on the webinars a bit when we're working with the NHS, but I will re uh, kind of align some of those bits in as well as and when we go through the presentation tonight. Okay. Mm -hmm. So first things first, um, I'll just recap a little bit for those who might be new. What's the ABCDs? Well, this is the principle that I introduced on the first week. It's called asset-based community development and ultimately that's a bit of a framework for you to think about your club and what's in and around the community where i live and there's four things that kind of align to that and one is it focuses focuses on assets and strengths rather than problems and needs it mobilizes individuals and assets so in other words it's about overlapping things so if there is a skill that's somewhere else that might not be football could that same skill benefit football but in a different context uh, it's community driven so it's more of an inside out approach and it's all about relationships and those people that you know okay on our next slide and if you looked at it like lego in its <clears throat> simple terms and formats uh, just a quick one guys if you are on the call i think i've got pete and mark who might have their mics on so if you can um just do that for us. Just mute yourself, just so they don't get the feedback we just had then. Cheers, guys. Um, so if you look at your know, community as Lego, really, there's probably lots of separate bits that don't interlink together. And what this framework gives you is a bit of a, a plan to join up to Lego, shall we say. So in other words, if there is a, you know, something that's a strength, can it work in line with what you're offering as football? And on the other sense, can football help and benefit that partner, partner as well wider? Uh, we're all aware, obviously, of you know the work that Marcus Rashford's done in the last couple of days. The power of football can make a difference, and it's not really football is helping to change. It's helping to change something that was a need in you know provisions for summer for those people maybe on low income families, and those things can kind of help out overlapping where you might have a service or a provision that could benefit somewhere else. Next slide. And it's about common unity. That's something you would have heard me say for the last three weeks if you've been on. Common unity is looking at what are those shared common goals, common things that you do that might have unity and align with other organisations, places uh, and community members that therefore can add value. Next slide. And I've given this example um, to introduce most weeks. If you think about your club and you look at maybe... Uh, an area around your club, two, three miles, could be bigger if you're a rural club. What's there? So what are the physical spaces? What's the heritage and the culture of your area? What institutions are there? Who are the individuals that could maybe benefit through this or the networks that are already existing and the local economy? And using these as a framework, we've broken down the webinars into these four to therefore help and align with you guys to get some ideas as we go through and tonight is all about the institutions that might be in and around your club next slide and that two-way street i think you know i mentioned it briefly that post covid and we're starting to get back to some sort of football now that you know we're going to have a range of different needs um wants we're probably going to be looking at skill sets that maybe some of your coaches your normal committee members might not have could be charity partners could be the institutions that we look to work with we might not have worked with before and we all know that there's going to be a range of things that might change it could be um 
services that you need. It could be things like mental health, as an example. Could be that funds are different now, so people are going to have to work together to get development funds or look into you know more um, capacity of what you're doing. So making sure it's that two-way street. What can football give? But on the other hand, what can football benefit from? and where others can help out with that along the way, a two-way street. So our next slide just kind of overviews that, and our institution is our key one. And if you go to our next slide, we're looking at two different areas really tonight. Schools, colleges, universities is kind of our education establishments. Our armed services and health is kind of our second part, okay? And what we want to do, I mean, my aim really within the the error, error and a bit issues about what can you take away that you go, do you know what? Maybe we could do that with our club or maybe that's an idea that I didn't know before. And that's the whole point. We will be interactive. So I will be asking you to use the chat box. So if you don't know where the chat box is, just have a little look for it now. And I will be asking to do that because I might pick on some of you to share and give some examples. Um, and remember, you know, this is me giving you some insight but this is about you. What might you have knowledge as well? Because we all don't know everything. And our next slide, please. So, start off with the chat box then. I want to know, what are your current relationships with education establishments? So, what that might mean is, how do you link with them already? Is it the fact you get players from there? What are your links for your club with the schools, colleges, and universities in and around your footprint at the moment, all right? And we'll go to the chat box and we'll see what comes in. Over to you guys. Share and care. Local college partnerships, students, okay? So we've got some placements, I think, from Michelle. Thank you. Maybe it helps to get their work done, yeah? Mascots, like it. Player recruitment. Training facilities, I saw there. Yeah, college football program, great. Coaches, so you go into the college. Primary schools, you host events, great. Education, after school clubs, training, yeah, player recruitment from Helen, brilliant. Uh, open days, CPD. Okay, so I'm going to pick on one of you. Some great answers so far. Thank you for your interaction. Uh, I'm going to pick, is it Jeremy and Ruth Reynolds? So if you wouldn't mind unmuting and just tell us a little bit about who's your club and a little bit about your message that you've put on there about what you do with schools. Um, yes. Uh, how do we do that? Oh, yeah. um, we, hello? Can we, you? Can, we can hear you. Let's oh, you can out. hear me. Sorry, I couldn't. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm Jeremy Reynolds. I'm chairman of uh, Biggles Wade FC. Um, we're just a club, just a senior club, just under four years old, so we're quite recent. Um, my career has been education and teacher and advisor. Um, so we've had um, match day mascots from uh, from the school. We've had lots of links going into the school. And it, it chimes with what you're saying about um, how we can support the school because they're big on values. So we've uh, presented, we, we've got a values cup that we uh, get presented in the school regularly. So the school values, we try to exemplify that with the club. We've had a couple of players going in assembly talking about things like teamwork and resilience and how what they try to develop in school chimes with what we do um, at the football club. Brilliant. So you're matching up their values by offering them a service that might be able to inspire or align yeah. in through so football. It has a, it has a, so it has a mean, so the values of the children, it has a meaning in terms of what the uh, their their role models that young players a little bit older than them are doing every day match days um, with the club like resilience coming back from being behind teamwork how the team can yep. progress work as a team that kind of stuff jeremy that's awesome thanks for that share if you wouldn't mind just uh, popping yep. your microphone off now thank you so there's a great example straight away of using football for good uh, rather than the traditional things which we may get so if we go to our next slide I knew that most of your answers would probably cover these three things. You predominantly might work with your schools, colleges and universities for maybe some volunteers, maybe getting new players 
and using of their facilities. And ultimately, you know, that's probably the top three things that you would link with your education establishments for. Because investment into facilities tends to be either on an educational site that would have a club partnership. Your recruitment of players would probably come from where young people are in the schools, in the colleges and universities. And your workforce, well, there's a need there. There's young people or young adults that need experience. You might be able to provide that and align that with some sort of workforce pathway as well. So thanks for that. Next slide. And we need you to go back to your text box here because I know it's not that easy sometimes working with your school, your college or your university. Sometimes you're going to get some barriers. Could be that no one gets back to you. Could be that you've not identified the right person or they've outpriced you. Just share with me a couple of your barriers, if that's OK, in the text box. What have you come across? It's been a barrier. So Anita saying some of the committee members been a barrier. Availability, I presume that's on facilities. Community office, not helpful. Yeah. Two-way communication, cost. Non-response, Daniel. Yeah, I know how you feel, mate. I've been there. Lead PE teachers don't like football. Yeah. Multiple clubs in a small demographic. Yeah, sometimes it waters it down. Yeah. Okay. Right, then, so I'm going to pick on one of you because we've got some great answers here. So I think I'm going to go with... Um, I saw a good one. Just let me go back to it. Sorry about that. Yeah, let's go to... Um, I think I'm pronouncing it right. Dahaj Udin. I think I have. Uh, would you mind unmuting, just telling us a little bit about availability and what you mean by that? Um, so in terms of we, what we've done is uh, we, this, we, we operate over two sites, one primary school and one uh, secondary school. So what's happened with that secondary school is uh, what we tend to do is once kids finish school, um, they tend to go home and because we're working with um, North Asians and they've probably got mosques, do some uh, Islamic studies and then trying to find time, seven o'clock, six o'clock availability for slots isn't easy. Yeah. So what we're having to do is kind of like have three teams, four teams, five teams in one small area just to accommodate yeah. enough of our place to have uh, training either through winter or through some of the summer period. And do you think that's because they're valuing the the commercial income over oh, the relationship uh, with the, the conversations we've had? It's, it's, it's solely down to, I think, the commercial okay. interest more than... Uh, did I pronounce your name right? Yeah, you did. Yeah. That's a job. Appreciate it. Thank you for that, Chef. If you wouldn't mind just yes. muting. No I'm also going to pick on Michelle Dorling. Michelle, tell me about your no, uh, your non two way communication. If Michelle's there, Michelle Dorling. Hello. Oh, yeah. Tell me about that then. Your two way co communication often hindered. It's, it's even more embarrassing because I actually work at one of the colleges. <laughs> the person that deals with the sports department. We had a two-way two communication briefly. We wanted to set up a meeting, and that was about 18 months ago. Yeah. Not, I've chased them. They don't respond. Um, other than physically going to see her and tie her down, it's really, really difficult. There's lots of barriers. To the left hand, not talking to the right hand. Yeah, yeah. and that happens a lot. Um, we did partnership work with Rittle College, University College, which worked fabulously. It, it was amazing. The, the children, well, students had to do something for their college course, and that was to run an event. And we held a charity um, football match at um, Ormond Street. The turnout was phenomenal, and we had over a thousand people turn out for that because we kept it reasonable. Um, and the children organised it all, and we ended up with over 40 celebrities turn up. Wow. And what's your club, Michelle? Uh, I'm with the league, I'm with the 16 year league. Oh, brilliant. Okay, good. Thank you for that share. Yeah, it's really frustrating sometimes when you don't get that communication back. And, you know, many of the things which you guys have put in the chat box I've experienced in in one of my past roles. I used to be head of uh, sport and community. And really, we had um, a head teacher who didn't like football. So I get that. Also, non-prioritising a facility for those with students. 
uh, and also left hand not talking to the right. So thank you for sharing that with us, guys. So if we go to our next slide, we'll kind of look at how we can work and maybe be a bit more cleverer of how we can work with the education establishments. Most educational establishments will probably plead poverty with you with funding. So in other words, schools underfunded, colleges, it's really hard. University is a bit different because money comes from a different source, but you're a really key source of how you can help them win with funding. So as an example, in a local authority school, it's a really hard mechanism to get money in and get money out. But for your clubs, for an example, small grants that you might get through your county FA or your local partnerships for revenue-based things such as participation, that's quite easy for you to do. So you might be able to provide funding for your club to work with the school. That could be facility-wise as well. And in most football foundation-related bids, all schools would need club partners to get that funding. And if they don't have them, ultimately, they're not going to get that funding unless they're paying for it themselves. So think of the funding bit on this as well. It's a really key one. It's probably easier for you to have the mechanisms rather than the education establishment, because as we've just heard from Michelle, often the left hand don't talk to the right. So just to even spend stuff on some bibs or maybe about uh, a promotion for girls football, it's easier for the monies to come through to you to pay for some of the provisions. Uh, to the top right there, the workforce one, if you just go back to the one we were on, please, Daniel, if that's all right. The workforce one's a key one, really. Now, I really like uh, what we heard before about using values. So one of the football clubs uh, I've worked with in the past, they use some of their football players, and this was non-league, um, to as mentors. So people to aspire to, reading champions. So rather than just looking at workforce uh, from your club as just coaches, can it be those wider skills as well? Someone to, you know, encourage attainment, uh, confidence, resilience, those sorts of things which make good British citizens. And it could be that when you're contacting your schools, normally, uh, schools or colleges, normally if you're contacting them about provisions, football, 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 sometimes people don't take that. But if you just reword what actually football can offer and look at it and break it down of the things such as confidence, hard work, teamwork, uh, communication skills. Maybe through the mechanism of football, you can get those skills out of it and offer that as a provision instead. And I think these are more widely appealing to the education establishment than maybe just the provision of football, but you can sell it in a different way. The bottom left, um, what I mean by that one is students often can do stuff that we can't so an example module outcomes are key here and i'm not saying you need to be an expert on the national curriculum college curriculums etc but most colleges will have a uh, nvq or btech for an example that probably covers customer service marketing and communication now if you have a gap that you need someone to help out or do this Obviously, that's a placement opportunity, same with universities as well. And it could widen what you already has as a club, but then a win-win for the college or university where it helps them with an outcome in their work too. To the bottom right, obviously, the Marcus Rashford example. Uh, now, we know that you know free school meals, as an example, is something that will be vouchers for this summer. But there's lots of provisions that your club can still provide to help out those people uh, who are on free school meals. But if you talk with your school and share the provisions that might go on for holiday hunger, for an example, football that carries on throughout the year, things that might link into uh, attainment and success, but you might target certain students because the school shares with you geography, demographics, but actually find out a little bit more about what you're doing Maybe that's a different way to kind of, you know, link what your football club's doing. And there are school PTAs, uh, family links and liaisons in most education establishments. And sometimes when we contact the teachers, 
ultimately it's not high on their priority because their priority is student attainment. So it's looking at who else is there to link with you. A school, for an example, would probably have pastoral officers. Uh, colleges will have some sort of pastoral lead too. And at universities, it would be that outreach uh, and communities team. Looking differently rather than going through the teachers sometimes can help out for you to try and achieve what you might need. But on the other hand, they win as well. And remember that principle, win-win. What can you get? What can they get? But sell it a little bit differently. Next slide. And we have uh, organisations which are championing the work of uh, the education establishments. So an example, something you're going to get a little bit later, a lot of schools don't have any community access policies. And the policies really prevent schools opening up because they might not have the infrastructure or know what to do. So one of the things I've put on there from Sport England is a community access policy and agreement template. So you might be able to solve the problem with an education establishment. You might want to use their facilities. They currently might not know how to do that, or you could do it together. That's one example that's on there. Uh, the Youth Sport Trust that tend to cover more of your uh, primary and secondary school age groups, they have a lot of workforce um, aspirations and leadership. So how can young people be successful in helping out um, as part of like playground leaders or aspiring others? But again, that's a shared skill. Is that something that your club can help with, something you could recruit into or align to? And there's a big push at the moment with girls football through the Youth Sport Trust and some of the partners and programmes that are there. With books, so that's British Universities uh, College Sport, they are essentially, uh, they provide a lot of stuff around competitions and pathways. But another angle for them is workforce and employability. So sharing across um, some of their themes targets aspirations is something where your club could help out with as well again i've put their link on there uh, to do that because effectively you know you've got an adult there some of your easiness of getting young people involved could link to their studies to an aligning of what the shared outcome could be that we're going to hear a little bit more about aoc sport oversee colleges um, and again, it's predominantly um, their traditional work is competitions and pathways, but there is a large theme there around leadership, employability, opportunities, coaching, volunteering. And again, I've put that link on there to have a look at, which therefore you've got some strategies from the, uh, the, the overseeing body uh, that can align back into your local institution. OK, so that will be some insights shared with you at the end of today. Thank you. Next slide. And we're going to hear now, I'm going to invite Pete. Pete, can you hear me? Yeah, you found unmute, yeah? Yeah, I found it. Can you hear me? We can hear you. That's the good news, yeah? We're oh, halfway oh, there. <laughs> so all the things I've been talking about, um, Pete's going to talk us through a little bit about what he does and their club and how they kind of get some of this win-win going there. So, Pete, we're over to you, my man. Thanks very much, everybody. I'll hopefully just skip through this in about 10, 15 minutes and I'm quite available for questions afterwards. First of all, the Sir Tom Finney Press and Soccer Centre and Football Club. The structure of that is two. It's two separate uh, entities. The Sir Tom Finney Press and Soccer Centre is a registered children's charity, albeit it does provide football opportunities for adults. And, then, and that's run by a group of... Um, the, the trustees, and then the, the Sir Tom Finney Football Club is run by a committee uh, of eight. I'm chairman of both of the clubs. So I'll just move on and tell you a background of who we are. We started in 1999 as the Preston Soccer Centre, um, and Sir Tom Finney became our president in 2005, and we changed our name then to the Sir Tom Finney Preston Soccer Centre. When we started in 1999, we utilised a facility called Ford Barracks in Preston, which was an active uh, army barracks. Within two years, we'd outgrown that for security reasons, and we moved to in 2001 to the Cotton Sports Arena, which in 2006 became the UCLan Sports Arena, with the University of Central Lancashire taking over the, the venue. 
We're, as I mentioned, we're established uh, children's charity, we're a charter standard club, and we are now a hub club working in partnership with both UCLAN, the Football Association, and Books, already mentioned by Russ. Uh, I mentioned on that slide there in 2015, we uh, had a football activator who was funded by the FA and Books, and I'll touch on that shortly when we go through the presentation. Next slide, please. So in 2014, unfortunately, with the passing of Sir Tom, um, we were fortunate enough to get Graham Alexander, who was uh, captain of Preston North End, Burnley, Scotland, etc., to become our president. At that time, and it was a coincidence that it coincided with the passing of Sir Tom, we were, uh, we were approached by the Lancashire Football Association and Books and the University of Central Lancashire to see whether we would become a hub club for them, which basically was around starting competitive football opportunities for people who weren't currently involved in football. That gave us, as a group of trustees for the charity, a bit of a dilemma because we were all for football for all. And as you'll all know, if you have football teams, by definition, you have to have either a selection or a deselection process to get five, seven, nine, eleven, fifteen 15 uh, squads together. We talked about it and we decided we would do it, but we'll do a bit of a twist in that. We agreed to put competitive teams in, but we agreed to only take those children who weren't deemed good enough to play for established clubs or indeed whose parents and the social background didn't allow them to due to the, uh, the fees that clubs actually charge. So I went to the local leagues, discussed it with them, and we agreed to register our teams, but only register players after everybody else had done so. We started off in 2014 with two teams and for next season we're going to have 28 teams. We have partners in British Red Cross, certainly around the refugees, Lancashire Constabulary around the disadvantaged and referred children, Preston City Council, Active Lancashire, Lancashire Array and Lancashire Children's Services who also send disadvantaged children to us. Next slide please. There's some of the services we do. I'll touch on them very quickly as we go through. But I'm sure you don't need me to read them all out to you, but they're all there. So we can move on to the next slide. This is our Able Body Coaching. Every Saturday morning, we now have approximately 110 children turning up for football coaching at the University of Central Lanks, um, ages 4 to 16 years. We do disability uh, football as well on a Saturday morning and what we try to do <clears throat> is why we don't integrate them into the sessions. We have the sessions for the disabled children 4 to 16 going on alongside the able-bodied children. It's £4 a session, pay on the day if you can afford to, if you don't, you don't pay and those people or children that are referred to as by Lancashire Stab or the Chil Lancashire Children's Societies and the refugees children don't pay, they have free places. And you see a nice picture there of some of our university students and a couple of police officers. I have quite close links to Lancashire Constabulary. Thank you, the next slide. Disability coaching. Uh, we took this all over a group of disabled adults on a Friday night, going back about eight years now, nine years. Um, oldest one is about, well, he's about 60 now. Um, and we have, and I, an average attendance of 35 every Friday night, but we have 65 different disabled players registered with us. Um, as I mentioned already, we have the free disability coaching for the children on a Saturday morning. And we've also got four adult uh, pan-disability teams playing competitive football in our local disabled leagues. And I'll mention a little bit more about that as we go on. So we have now most Saturday mornings throughout the summer period, 40 disabled adults playing in uh, four teams for us. Again, run by the university students. Next one, please. Four years ago, we were approached um, by the lady, as you look at your picture on the bottom right-hand side in the bobble hat. She's a volunteer with uh, the British Red Cross who are responsible for looking after the placements and welfare of refugees and asylum seekers in the greater Preston area. She also has two children playing in our uh, competitive youngsters teams. She approached me and asked if we could do anything for the refugees. We said we'll have a look at it and we did. So on a Friday night, following on from our disability group, we now have an average of 30 disabled adults, to, uh, disabled refugees, asylum seeker adults turning up 
every Friday night. Some of them will walk for about 45, 50 minutes from the far reaches of Preston just to come and train. All their kit, the boots, the chin pads, the socks, the shorts, the shirts, everything is provided by ourselves. And they leave it there, have a shower and change room, leave it there. And uh, my wife has a joyous job of um, cleaning it all thereafter. We play quite a few friendlies with the refugee teams against local groups and the university students. And we've just had our first uh, refugee through the international clearance, believe it or not. And he's now playing for our Saturday men's team. And we've got three of our refugees currently waiting to go on their level one FA coaching courses. So another good result there. Again, at the, the look at that picture at the end, the uh, three people st stood up behind the lady with the bobble are, are students and at the other end, the gentleman knelt down is a student. Next one, please. As I mentioned earlier, competitive teams started in 2014 as a result of the partnership we have with uh, Lancashire FA and Books. This has grown and grown and grown. Now, we now have teams from under seven up to under 16. This year we're starting two girls only teams under nine, under 11, although we do have quite a few girls playing for our uh, mixed teams. We have four disabled adults teams. We have two adult male teams playing in the Sunday League, an adults male team playing in the Saturday League. We have an over 35s team new for this season, wherever it gets off. And we have two adult ladies football teams playing in the Northwest Regional League and the Lancashire Ladies League. The ladies and the men's uh, teams have several uh, University Central Lancs students playing for them. They don't have to pay any registration fees to come and join us, but they come along and join us as part of our partnership with the University of Central Lancs. So next slide, please. Volunteer opportunities. One of the big things about this is we don't have any paid posts at all with the Tom Finney Football Club or the Tom Finney Soccer Centre, although we do have an excess of 150 volunteers. Last season we had 160 volunteers, of which 60 were University of Central Lank students. We, we look after our volunteers, we develop them along the lines that they wish to be developed and we pay for all the courses they go on, the kit um, and everything really for them and look after them. We also run a young coaches scheme so that when children or young people are aged 12 plus we if, and they want to get involved in coaching we put them along with an experienced coach on the saturday mornings we will cover the cost of any age related um courses that they go and do with the lancashire football association and when they are 16 we will pay for them to do their level one course and then they give their time back to us by volunteering and coaching saturday mornings or indeed on a wednesday night or friday nights we also organise holiday clubs, uh, organise, advertised and run by the University uh, of Ukraine students and they are held at the university uh, ground, which obviously then gives university students far more experience, but also pay. They get paid about £50 a day for it. So about that, I'd just like to talk to how we've actually done this, how we've been successful at getting 60 students, um, 155 volunteers. Before 2014 and becoming the Hope Club, Around about 20, 2006, when the Cotton Sports Arena became the Yukon Sports Arena, we were obviously then utilising university ground, university places. So we started getting an into the university. I'm not saying for one minute it was easy. It was quite difficult. It's taken us 15 years, 16 years to get to where we are now. So it's not easy and it certainly wasn't quick. But over time, by me badgering, my wife badgering, we've managed to get into going to the... Um, the freshers' furs when they all come to university, to the volunteers' furs. You'll all be aware, I would think, that now in most degrees, the students have to complete a minimum of 100 hours of community service, which is great. But for clubs like us, we like to get in at the, the year one. We found that getting into year one and keeping the year one students with us for three, maybe four years, we get far more value out of them. We're paying a lot of money for them to do the level ones, level twos. Um, we keep them for the three, four years and we have it that way. Um, we're now part of the lecturers, the first year lecturers timetable. And this has all come about. And I mentioned right at the first slide on the first slide about a football activator who was funded by the FA and the 
books. In 2015, after it was agreed in 2014 to become a hub club, there was a paid post um, put into University Central Langs. Their role was to generate far more competitive football within the university, but also within the community, and we benefited from his post. Unfortunately, that fund has now ceased, um, so that's no longer with us, but that kickstart helped us no end. It's now allowed us to get into all the freshers' furs, um, at the University of Central Langs. We are now part and parcel of the year one timetable going into lectures to present what we can provide at, at the Sir Tom Finney. That's not just sports um, courses. We also go into sports management. We go into um, physiotherapy. We go into the hospital courses and also media courses. And we talk to them and we get an awful lot of volunteers that way. So it's not been easy, but we've managed to get there. And obviously the last one would be providing lots of benefits for the students to come along. They see it, they're paying £9,000 a year now, and at the end of their courses, they want to have jobs. So as I'll explain in the next slide, please, the benefits they get from us are quite substantial. Um, you can see there, we will pay for them and cover the cost for them to go up to a UA for B license. We would have had three former students actually nearly completing the UEFA B licence now, if it hadn't been for COVID. Those three that are doing it have all been with us since the year one course at uh, University of Central Lance. They've been with us now for five, six years between them. All three of them were going to be doing the UEFA B and staying with us. They're local, well, they weren't local, two of them weren't local, but having been to Preston University, they've now got jobs in the Preston area and stayed with us. We do the level one, level two as a matter of course, if they wish to do so. Coaching disabled footballers, first aid, futsal and welfare officers. But they're also all the DBS checked. Last year, um, university students benefited in excess of 7,500, not each, but in totality, um, for the money that we as a club paid for their qualifications. We provided all the kit and we also provide the transport. The students get the opportunity of putting into theory into practice, this, the classroom-based theory, and they come and do it actually hands-on. As I mentioned before, holiday clubs, they get an opportunity to plan and also make some money during the summer holidays. They get that experience of planning, organising, leading sessions. They get coaching opportunities. I will write numerous um, references for students to go aboard on the challenges to Canada and the USA. We've had about 30 students now go to Canada and the USA to gain very an experience. And they obviously get jobs. Um, we've now got quite a, a list. We keep a historic list of the students who've got jobs. We've got students now who were coaches with us now working at Manchester United, Burnley, West North End, Blackpool, Fylde, Fleetwood, all mainly in the community aspects of those clubs, but still having full-time jobs as a result of working with us and getting the degrees at University Central Langs. We have about 10 students who are now teachers. Um, and in addition to university, uh, the university make about seven and a half, seven thousand pound from us for hire of the facilities. So our FC train on a Wednesday night, uh, University Central Langs um, are all our home games for the teams of, and the adults all play university pitches on Saturday and Sundays and the soccer centre is based at university on a Saturday morning. So next slide please. The future, um, as I mentioned we currently have four disabled teams, one of the leagues that they play in has folded so we're looking and we would have been looking to do it now we haven't been for Covid, uh, setting up our own regional adult disability league, again run by the students and based at UCLan, again giving them invaluable experience and making more opportunities for our disabled players. Every year now we put in a minimum of two under sevens teams um, and we will continue to do that. If we have sufficient players and volunteers to run teams at any other age, we'll add them to the league because at the university we managed to fit them all in for pitches. We we're very, very lucky that way. So what's gone well for us over the years? Well, the student recruitment in year one, you've seen the results of the students we get. Um, we, ex we introduce those students to the experienced students that are with us for three years. So they then form support groups themselves, which seems to work well and ensures that they stay with us. We pay for all the kits, so they get shorts, socks, 
um, shirts, waterproofs, all with a Sir Tomfany name on. Um, we have a welcome do for them where, again, for students, they get the food for nothing and they get to know the uh, experienced students. We utilise students now on all the furs, all the uh, freshest furs and the volunteers' furs because it's far better than me talking to the students. It's far better than the students who have actually experienced and got the qualifications doing it and it works. Um, obviously, a variety of uh, opportunities and we have a large number, so we don't expect now students to work every Saturday because of going home at term time, go over their, ex uh, their exam times. We have enough now we can be very flexible with them. And we also balance the number of students who are local to the Preston area with overseas students and those students that travel into Preston, again, to balance off uh, people leaving for half term. And again, I would say, whilst it's been very, very hard work, over the years, it has, is now burning flu, uh, fruit. What was problematic? We expected, Pete, yeah. I've got to say, you're an inspiring guy. And uh, you know what? How do you get time in the day to do anything uh, well, else? I'm retired now. I'm, uh, <laughs> I was a senior police officer, a police officer, so I know exactly why I was setting up. There's obviously spent off benefits from that. But I also fill the time in doing all sorts of volunteering stuff. Pete, that's brilliant. We thank you for your share. Guys on the call, we've got a chance to ask you a couple of questions and a little bit about education, but I'm sure you'd all like to mirror and thank Pete for showing of the great work of uh, Sir Tom Finney Club and the Soccer Centre, really. Pete, thank you for that. It's a pleasure. Anytime. No problem. Stay on the line because we will ask you some questions soon. And thank we, you. We now should have Charlotte. Charlotte, are you there? Hiya. Hiya. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Beautiful. Would you like to tell us a little bit about your programmes, provisions at the University of Portsmouth and how it aligns with uh, your grassroots hub? Yeah, um, well, hopefully I can sort of give the other perspective um, to Pete because I'm going to talk from, um, from the university point of view. I work in a university sports department. I'm a sports development manager. So part of my role there is about um, developing sport. In, uh, not only in the university but in the community as well so, um hopefully that'll give a, a bit a slightly a different yeah. to what that'd, you've just heard that'd be brilliant so like what are your priorities in our football clubs and outreach work can help with that'd be brilliant okay um so do i uh, yeah um so i'll just give a bit of um background to our university um i'll try and keep it um fairly generic because the thing about universities is that they do differ greatly and um, different universities will have different priorities so I'll try uh, and cover sort of what most universities aim to achieve and um, so that would be benefit to sort of everyone listening. So in terms of our university strategy, like many universities we do have a commitment to local community and welcoming local people onto our facilities. And that's to promote sort of learning, any engagement, and obviously sport is, a, is an excellent tool to do that. In a city like Portsmouth, where where football is very strong, obviously for us it's quite useful to sort of tap into that tool. The local community enthusiastic and passionate about football, um, and we've got football facilities. So there's all there is a sort of obvious link there. Um, all universities have something called an access and participation plan, something that they're actually obliged to have um, to receive some of the funding that they get. And it's the obligation of the university to widen access to higher education. And by that, that means that um, it's, it's really about encouraging people from the local community to access university. So I'm not talking about, um, you know, students na nationwide, but those on our doorstep making them feel that university is for them and it's part of their community. But not only that, those that have parents that might not have gone to university, so um, like in they're, they're known as sort of first generation um, students. So we do a lot of outreach work and that's not just in sport, but across the board to encourage um, local young people um, to access the university facilities so that they become familiar with us and hopefully um, feel that university is a place for them. So every university will have what's called an access and participation plan. It will be a long and complex document, but 
if you wanted to if you've got a university local to you or near to you that's something that you could view and that you can find out a bit more about and find a bit more about what your university's priorities are um, and there'll be lots of specifics there about um, the types of engagement that, that they're looking at in addition um, there's something called civic universities which I, I believe our university signed up to this as 50 institutions um, across the country are signed up to that and that's about a commitment to developing their communities and um, sport is is an obvious way to do that so that's just an overview really of some of the university strategic priorities that might overlap uh, with with football and, and it's important if you want to start talking to universities is just to understand what their priorities are and the types of people that they want to engage with and a lot of those people will be already engaged with football or in some of your football programs um, so although I'm part of the university I sit within the sports department at the university and we have our own sort of specific strategic aim so what we need to achieve as a department and obviously a lot of that is student facing it's about the students that are already paying fees to come to us and us delivering activities for them but um, to align with the university strategy we have also got a commitment to the local community so um, a lot of our, our aims are around just increasing participation but not only um, in our own university community but also in the in the wider the wider local community as well um, and uh, there's a lot of overlaps I think in terms of developing football uh, around our strategy where we've got uh, we identify the importance of engagement with local schools and colleges um, and how that widening participation and recruitment activities can happen through sport. Talked a little bit before in the previous um, presentation about the student workforce and how volunteering and development is really important for students and um, you know it's all about getting value for money for their degree and how we can add value to that and how we can and make sure that those students are getting the employability skills that they need to get them um, to the next stage uh, post university once they graduate they can demonstrate skills beyond their degree um, and sport and football can offer those uh, we're also obliged to make links of our fe colleges and schools locally and um, to meet that widening participation and gender and um, and build stronger community relations not only that we're fortunate enough and not every university will have this but we've got we've got sports degree courses so that's really um, specifically we'll have students that are looking for those sports related opportunities outside their degree to develop their their own portfolio of skills so that's our strategy and um you'll probably be able to view um the sports department strategy for your university um, local to you if you have one local to you um, it's worth getting online and have a look a lot of these are, are public documents and i think if you start to understand what universities are looking to deliver through their sports program then you can think how how, you, how it's possible to link up and complement um, each other and work together so i'm going to talk a little bit about um, how we've developed football through some of our programs while we've done what we've done um, and how we've been able to achieve that. Uh, we've created something called the Portsmouth Football Pathway, which um, I'll, sh I'll talk a little, a little bit more about in the next slide, but that's about a real formalized link with our local college and trying to create a pathway for local young people um, through both education and football so that they can enter a program of football at sort of under sevens and continue on that same pathway through to college and then hopefully through to university um, it's meant that we've actually rather than adopting a community program we've tried to develop our own through building our own links we've also got li good links with hampshire fa we've similar to um, the preston example we've achieved um, some funding for our hub club so we work with hampshire fa on delivering that obviously good partnerships with local schools and um, we need that to feed into our football programs and um, as of I think we're into our second year now of being the shirt sponsor on um, Portsmouth Football Club shirt which is great for profile in the local community so I think that's helped us to develop our programs and and 
build that association with football um, that we haven't had before. So we started developing uh, our, our football outreach probably 10 years ago. So that's how long it's take, taken us to create that pathway. But obviously, in the last couple of years, coming on board with reports of football club has helped people um, sort of it's strengthen that association really. And maybe local young local young people seeing that we have that association with their club and there is a strong passion for for that so that's helped us really so i'll talk a bit about our collaboration with hampshire fa um we, we deliver a lot of the programs as a university that i'm sure some of you do you guys do as clubs um such as wildcats uh, drop-in sessions and our own um, internal football leagues which is more student focused so Wildcats, which will be familiar to, to a lot of you guys, is a way of us um, providing opportunities for students because there's coaching opportunities there, but also getting young people on the pathway. So starting from, from a very young age and then feeding them into some kind of competitive football. And obviously with a focus on females um, with that particular example. Uh, it's probably taken us about, in terms of workforce, to develop a referee hub, probably about... I'd say about six years where we've got quite a strong um, recruitment and training process for students to become referees. And that's not just for our internal courses, but that's these guys delivering in our community football programs and delivering, at, I suppose, football at a higher level externally in the local community. So we work with Hampshire FA to deliver that. And that's really beneficial for students and obviously really beneficial for the local community. It's a great way for students to earn a bit of cash and um, they can work in local grassroots football. They can support our programs. It's been really successful. Um, similar to the Preston example, you know, getting the students some coaches and courses and getting them delivering in our own football programs and uh, various different types of, of CPD to complement that. And um, working with Hampshire FA to deliver their objectives on um, developing clubs and leagues. So we're creating competitive football for boys and girls from. Um, from under seven and up. Um, so that's um, just part of how we support Hampshire FA in what we do. So the pathway is pretty, it looks pretty complicated. Uh, it's, it's quite hard to articulate at times, but hopefully by looking at this diagram, it's a bit more digestible. So um, like, we, like I said, it's, it's a partnership with the college essentially to look at how we can create a journey for young people to, to access football and their education. Um, so it's not just focusing on those competitive opportunities or staying in competitive, competitive football, but there's, there's a coaching pathway for them, um, a pathway into apprenticeships, a pathway into college. So um, a young person can enter the program as young as the TOTS program. Um, and we then start our travel teams, as we call them, for under seven to under 10. Uh, which we partner with um, a grassroots club, which is Soccer Scholar. Once the once the transition for boys goes into nine aside, they identify as the University of Portsmouth and they train and play on our facilities and the same for girls as well. Now, from that point, so when they reach under 16s, there's a pathway for them into the, into the local college. And through that pathway, they can take an elite football um, BTEC and the coaching pathway. Um, ob obviously, aspirationally, we'd like them then to stay within football and uh, come to university and support our football programmes there or and continue to play football. Um, and that has happened for some of our, there have been students that have played in our junior teams because we've been running the programme for quite a long time and um, progress into our um, progress into a col into our university football teams or continue to coach in our university programs. So that's the aspiration of the the pathway. The challenges of that is, I th I think, is getting young people from both boys and girls from their grassroots football into college football. Um, that's probably the sticking point. Um, it's where you need to have a lot of attention and care to retain those young people keep them in competitive football and keep them in an education pathway. Um, but like I said, we've had both boys and girls progress from under 12 girls that are now at university in our 
first team university women's team so it it is effective um the advantages of us sort of pooling all our resources is that we've got a really good development pathway for coaches so once they get into college they start their coaching pathway um, and we can support and develop them um, with wh whichever path if they don't come to university they will have by the time they've got through college they'll be um, really well equipped um, in terms of having their coaching skills um, developed so that's an overview of the pathway um, we have looked to review this um, I was chatting to Danielle previous to this call about the size of the program so that's it's kind of a victim of our own success the, the program's grown considerably and although we have got good facilities it's um you know they are limited and there's only so many teams we can run at every age group so we're kind of looking to condense that and um consolidate what we do maybe focus on quality over quantity and we're having some discussions with the college at the moment about where our boys teams sit so um it is under review uh, we're constantly looking to review and tweak it so that it always remains a relevant program um, but the partnership with the college will always be important to us and will always be important to us delivering football, although we feel we're probably better placed to support women's football and the college probably better placed to support boys' football, um, but continue to work together on that. Um, so the achievements, uh, similar to Preston, you know, the opportunities for students to develop and gain their employment skills um, and be part of that workforce, has been really important and was really the main reason why we, we started this in the first place. Probably 10, 12 years ago, it would have been difficult for us to pick out a first year student, put them on an FA level one and chuck them in a local football team because the infrastructure wasn't there. So what we tried to do was create our own infrastructure and environment, which was focused around the student. And that's probably where the pathway came from. Um, obviously, grassroots football, I feel like it's moved on in that time. and grassroots clubs are probably better placed now to support students and um, I think they have a lot more support in terms of CPD and offerings from the FA to make sure that environment's right but at the time of starting this it probably was a slightly different picture um, so that's probably changed our focus a little bit as well because we feel like there's probably lots of places now that these students can go outside of our environment where they'll get a really good experience um, so, as I said, we grew our own community club called University of Portsmouth, playing in local leagues, both boys and girls team, um, achieved charter standard, club of the year, we've achieved um, Wildcats, um, I can't even think what the title was, but uh, similar sort of accolade. Um, we've got 10 youth teams, a strong presence in the community. Uh, but that's continued to grow and grow and for us it's probably more about now looking at how we focus that and how we make sure that it remains relevant and sort of ticking all the boxes so the the benefit of the pathway and us linking up with the college is the shared resource that we've got and um, to be able to sustain the program and grow it in the way that we have they obviously cater for the younger age groups and we've create that pathway for those those um, young people looking to continue and then their pathway back into the college um, Wildcats has been great for us. It's been a way for us to attract funding to develop girls' football um, and provide some sort of sustainability to our drop-in sessions. And um, as I've said before, the Referee Hub uh, has been great not only in supporting our own programmes but getting young people out into the um, into local grassroots football, being able to earn money and develop their their refereeing skills. So in terms of what we've done as a pathway, we um, we will continue to deliver this, whether we receive funding from um, as a hub or not. This is something that meets all our strategic objectives. So looking back to, you know, if you're looking to have these conversations with universities or colleges, it's about understanding what they want to achieve, what they what they want for their students. Um, the, we've through football, we've been able to develop so many opportunities that are valuable to our students that we would continue continue them regardless of the funding available from the FA or not. These are things that we've 
we've sort of grown ourselves we've been able to attract funding because of what we've, what we've been able to achieve but um, this, they'll remain important to us and integral to our delivery so we will continue to develop referees offer internships coaching and officiating um, continue to mentor young people um, and young coaches and just continue to support local grassroots football um, student development was always at the center of what we've done but we feel like the, the wider benefits have helped the program to grow thank you charlotte uh, i think given the other side perspective it's quite good and especially you know for you guys that might have a university in and around you colleges predominantly would have the same uh, schools might be a bit different but they might have uh, other priorities or their visions and values have a look for those on the websites they are public documents and that's maybe a good starting point as i said before of how you engage and build that better relationship i think what we're going to do here i planned it a little bit different but i'm going to introduce you to those wider institutes and then we're going to open the floor for questions so essentially um think of some questions for pete and charlotte then i'm going to give you a little bit more about working with the police health uniform services etc and then we'll have some questions and we all know thank you for the updates that raheem sterling has scored as well so thank you for that too guys on the chat okay so you need your chat button uh go to our next slide please and my question for all of you is in a low-income community or family how much would you say is the average spend per week on leisure and how much would they spend on average on a club subscriptions per year so let's have an example there subs how much would you say in your chat box what do you think is the average spend for families on a low income to spend per week on leisure or on subscriptions per year okay so we've got some in height, it's got five pound, we've got seven pound, 80 pound, 10 pound, less than 10 pound, 90 pound, cool. Okay then, let's go to our next slide then. So, from some recent uh, research from Sheffield Hallam, three pounds 21 a week is the uh, average spend per week on leisure. So let's have an example that's i've got two kids one of them can go swimming the other one can't okay now the average household's 12 pounds so maybe that's some of your members and maybe that's some who fall into the lower brackets and subscriptions a year was 29 pounds so i'm pretty sure that a lot of the football clubs that you guys might have i, I can't pay play for your team for 29 pounds a year the average household's 120 so just to put that into context about maybe some of the wider bits of need and link and to link this to back to some of the sport england tools um, that i spoke about before you know dependent on your household income sometimes you're half as less likely to therefore to play to be coached to volunteer to be a part of an event and therefore you're kind of behind from your affluent peers or those who might have um, better household income. But football does really good on this on the whole, really. You know, football's a really um, traditional sport that will help out a lot of young people who might not be able to afford it or those families. You have a good tradition within that. But the national stats tell us differently. OK, next slide. So you need your text box again. How much does youth crime cost us as taxpayers per year so that's young people between the age of 11 to 18 how much does that cost us as taxpayers per year we've had a twelve thousand in there five million one million thank you ben any more coming in okay uh, if you just press uh, next daniel it should come up well the answer is 11 billion pounds folks right 11 billion pounds now that's a lot of money especially in the environment post-covid where we are now where we're probably going to be in a recession all right and if you think about prevention through sport how youth crime costs us that but i've always lived on the uh, great saying of a kid in sports a kid out of court that we can prevent a lot of that 
with maybe some of the services, activities that your clubs will do. Next slide. And there's just, you know, a stat to help out underline that, really. Some of the prevention there is really key. Yeah, that's nationally happening. Um, so if you think that 88,000 10 to 17 year olds, for an example, when this study was done, are in the youth justice system, that costs a lot of money per kid. Now, prevention or positive pathways can help out, you know, change pathways and changing lives is a big thing that football can also offer. And, you know, if, if your club's doing that, great. Or is it something that you could partner up with those that know to help out to do that? Next slide. Now, obesity, inactivity is uh, one of the largest killers, really, as part of um, National Health Service uh, diseases in the future, heart disease, cancers, etc. So Sport England is our uh, government agency for getting more people active. How much do you think they've allocated to tackle inactivity uh, in England? How much do you think? In your text box again. 25 million and 11 million just. 1 billion, 5 million, 235. Well, the number's going up. <laughs> okay, let's go to the tick, which should show us. So there's £265 million pounds allocated over five years in this Sport England window to tackle inactivity. So in other words, just get people to move more, more often. But if you think about the prevention that the NHS, as an example, would cost us 10 times that amount per year, not over five years, and that's just the, the basics of prevention and treatment. And you think about the money that we've had to invest during this COVID period, it's going to be a little bit less of this stuff. So how your club can help out those get active who might not be active through things such as walking football, through social prescribing, which is something I spoke about a few weeks ago where people can be referred from the health practitioner to do activities with you and even part fund some of the things that you might have for mental health or for wellness or disability services is really key on the community agenda. Next slide. And you can work out what you might offer and what the social return on investment could be, which gives you a really big picture of how your club can show what you do to make the difference. This is a screenshot from one of the clubs I help out in with the Midlands and their basic um, social economic value of what they put back and save society was 757,000. And that's from a club called Worley Juniors. But that's through the work on volunteering, prevention from health service, reduction from crime. There's a range of calculators that you can use. And one of the links I'll share with you at the end is some of the tools you could calculate that for your club and the wider savings on society. Next slide. And there's a wide range of networks that links to last week that links here to institutions. You will have a community safety partnership in and around your club in your local authority area or in your county. That's somewhere where Pete, for example, he spoke a little bit about he got some money from the police to do some work that could link into prevention or positive activities. Your NHS will have a trust or a foundation within your area. Getting to know those guys and what their priorities are, just like the education establishments, will help you align and get some outcomes. Your voluntary sectors as well, aligning in for employment and your active partnerships, which used to be called your CSPs. Basically, they will have a lot of this local in intel and insight to link you in into the right places, but with the right demographical data to help you. Next one. And always look outside of football because that's what's going to help you post COVID. People will have the same priorities, but not under the football badge. People might have health needs, health inequalities. Uh, it could be about prevention of crime. But you can still help achieve those priorities, but you've got to look outside of football sometimes. Football might be your vehicle to deliver it, but it's how you work that together. Next slide. And just to finish off our presentation before we have questions, I thought I'd align community safety in there. And one of the projects I've been involved with for about eight, nine years uh, uses the police. And the police 
using football as their vehicle to to reduce crime in Smethwick. If you want to turn up your speakers on your headphones or on your PC, and I just had a, a couple of minutes interview with Dave uh, earlier today, just to overview a little bit about what they did. So as police officers, we look at ways to build community cohesion. Seven years ago, five of us um, did an FA Level 1 qualification and started weekly provisions on the park. This grew and we aligned with a community organisation called Benson Community. Okay, uh, and with that then, so how did you uh, link with the football club to help? So really looking at capacity, so for five officers on the park to now 618 18 year olds playing, um, helped having a drive as police work sometimes diverts us. Um, consistency is key um, for this. Yeah, I think you know, modern policing is you can't really be doing full session and they'd be called away to deal with the robbery on the ice street, can you really? Absolutely. So the football club to help there. What impact do you think it's had using football as part of your police work? Um, well, one statistic that we worked out a few years ago that was when Benson football was on, youth crime fell by over 70%. Wow. Also, the relationships, um, the prevention and the ability to signpost families. And people. We also um, help, it also helped us young people. You can see us as Dave the Copper. It was more Dave from Benson. I suppose that relationship between see you as the coach and build the relationship rather than you know, How sustainable is it then? Well, we come up with Benson with workforce, proceeds of crime, and grants and funding, and have joined up with the council and Seven years after doing uh, our level one alongside Benson, we have seen a change from young people now who are adults. Um, asking if they can even volunteer, which is it's, it's amazing really to see to see them grow uh, and want to help out. Smevik is a very diverse part of the country, um, but football speaks the universal language as well. Now. I think that's key, isn't it? Really, because like you know, short-term impact is fun, but long-term development makes a big difference. Something that you can continue to do. Uh, it's really important how police can really join the thing that needs to be So the last thing I'll ask you then, you can find out a bit more about you know, the work that the police do with Benson. So really the best the best way to look at it is Benson can be found on Facebook or on Twitter and um, that's at Benson Community. Give them guys a, a follow. And if anyone needs a day out, I'll be dead sure they can come have a lovely day out and spend the time. Absolutely beautiful place. Here's Dave, no worries. So just uh, briefly there, guys, effectively, the police started provisions, linked with the club, helped to reduce crime by 70% over a seven-year period when football's on. So that prevention obviously helps the police save money. We've just heard that it's £11 billion that youth crime costs us. So working for a shared outcome through football as something that's really helped uh, Benson as the club and Smethwick Police with Dave there make a big difference. And therefore, both parties benefit. As soon as the proceeds of crime funds come along, and just in case you don't know what those are, stuff that gets confiscated by the police, they sell it off and then they use the money to give back to the community. That's something that could, you know, ultimately align in and benefit your club if that's relevant to where you are. Next slide, please. So, as promised, here's some of the links, but we'll keep that screen on. I'm going to ask you now, we've got a chance for some questions. Pete should still be on the line, as should be Charlotte, so we can direct some of those uh, where we need to. And I'll invite Danielle back in, just to kind of have a look through and see who's relevant for what, guys. And thank you for your interaction so far tonight. Brilliant. Thanks, Ross. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Charlotte. Again, a 
very, very insightful. Um, oh, hour and hour and fifteen, hour and twenty. So it's uh, really, really good. Um, just waiting for some questions. Hopefully, to come in from the from the chat. There's been some great activity and some great interactions. So thank you very much for that. Um, please do pop any questions you have in the chat. I'm just scrolling through now just to uh, make sure I haven't missed anything. I'm sure if I know you well enough for us, you'll be doing the same, just making sure we haven't uh, missed anyone's important questions out. Just scrolling through all the numbers that you were all predicting based on some of Russ's questions. <laughs> well, I think we've got a question for Pete from James. So James oh, is asking, yeah. Pete, if you're there. What yeah, was you, so James has asked, what was your approach to get your disability service off the ground? We utilise the uh, LFA with a gentleman called Andrew Whitaker, who's a disability liaison officer there, responsible disability football, linked in with him. And he signposts now people that approach the LFA for disability football. Um, there was a need for it in the local area. We have people now travelling to us from the north of England from as high up as Barrow, uh, Lancaster. Some have actually come from Kendall down to Preston for it on a Friday evenings. But the main person we used was the, the LFA um, disability coordinator. So linking with your county FA, the top tip. Yes. There. Thanks, Pete. Uh, I've got a question which I'll answer uh, from Jed or Ged. I think it's Jed. Uh, proceeds of crime, who is the contact point? Uh, I mentioned before, most areas would either have A, a local police partnership or community safety partnership. Uh, on top of that, you should also have a police crime commissioner. Now, these are all Googleable to get the contacts of their offices, and they often have open rounds of funding. And proceeds of crime is something that probably comes around quarterly. Well, it does in the West Midlands, and I know from other clubs or colleagues in other areas, it's kind of every three months. And it's looking at what that um, money can be used for to put back into good community initiatives to help prevent crime. So hopefully, Jed, have a Google for your police crime commissioner or your local community safety partnership, okay? Uh, Charlotte, I think you might have this one. So, um, it says NCFCRDP, so I'm presuming that is a club. And it says um, he oversees three college programmes and they're trying to improve around the game, not just the players. Trying to enrich the scheme of the junior coaching club and areas. Any things you could recommend? So, I think the question there is about not just college football, linking that in with the club. How did that go, Charlotte? So, um, well, they, the, the difference probably is that we created the, the college created a junior arm. So it was kind of the other way around, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so they created junior football. Um, I think if you were to approach a college, um, it's, I mean, I don't know if I'm saying the obvious, but you know, looking at those colleges that are offering the vocational sports courses, you know, that's where you're going to make beneficial links. That's how we made um, links with Portsmouth College. Um, they have uh, sports leadership courses. They have courses with a high requirement of um, volunteer hours that you can link into um, creating um, volunteer opportunities within your club and not it's often it's about finding the right person i know that's e sometimes easier said than done but just finding an advocate within you know a local college or if it's a university that's passionate about working with the local community um so there'll be lots of contacts within individual sports departments but um you know there might it's about finding that right person and there will be someone who is passionate about making that link and and developing sport in the community. So um, it's about really networking, I suppose, um, networking with your, local, with your local FA or county FA and seeing if there's any college or university representatives going there. So then you know that they're, they're looking to create those links. Thank you, Charlotte. Great one. Errol, yes, these slides will be available. Daniel will share a little bit uh, about how that is. And I think we'll finish with AFC Didsbury Villa's question. What's the best piece of advice you can offer a new team 
who's setting up and want to establish a link with a local educational establishment. Uh, I'll start off on that one. My best piece of advice is find out what that education establishment's values, visions are, and then you've got a good starting point of some common unity. Where do you start from that they want and what you want? Pete, anything to add? Yeah, most of the establishments also have somebody responsible ability for the community or volunteers so they're a great person that's who i deal with mainly at university and the colleges we link into because they're looking for opportunities to send their students out to to obtain the volunteering hours and charlotte anything you'd add yeah i mean in terms of universities it's not just sports departments um, universities have whole departments that are committed to widening participation and community outreach so that's that's always a good starting point um if it don't traditionally just look at the sports departments there's other areas where they do get a lot of funding and there's opportunities there um to create links as well thank you so just to finish this up tonight guys you've got the slides that you'll get these links that are on the page here once you get the slides you can press them away and what I've put on there is Sport England's Inactivity Guide, uh, some more work about youth prevention in crime and sport, access to schools. There's a, uh, a community usage guide, as I mentioned before, some stuff there about the organisations, books, AOC, Youth Sport Trust, etc., that you can all use to link to your clubs. And lastly, I've put on there the Social Return Calculator, so that's something that you can download, have a play with, find out what you do and see what it might come out with in a return for investment on your club. Danielle, take us home. Brilliant. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, thanks to our guest speakers, Charlotte and Pete. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Russ, thank you very much for being the glue um, and steering yet another webinar in the right direction. Um, this is no no means of a plug, but I think it just ties in nicely with kind of this topic around working um, with young people. Um, we have a new course, like an introductory course coming out this summer called The Playmaker. So if you haven't heard of it, please do check out um, the FA Playmaker um, just via your normal search engine. It will come up with. Uh, information about the new course, which is for those that are from 14 upwards. So there was a previous course that was around and now this is the new course, an introductory level um, education piece that hopefully will help um, definitely link in with some of the topic areas that we've discussed today and hopefully widen in that little bit more around who you could potentially attract to your club or league within that wider community. So this is normally Russ's piece, but I'll definitely take this from him because he's been doing a great job so far. So uh, next week, our final webinar on this series does look at physical spaces and heritage and culture. So please do join us on the 24th of June um, for that webinar. Um, we've had the questions, which is great. Like I say, next week is all around places, spaces and faces, which does look link in and gives us that final overview of community engagement that does lead me to say thank you very much for your time this evening great dedication from all 111 of you that didn't dip into the premier league fixtures um, although some of you might have done and been exceptionally good at multitasking but like i say thank you very much for your time this evening and uh, take care we'll see you next week thanks folks it's two nil by the way to manchester city <laughs> Have an enjoyable evening, folks. Feel free to log off now. Thank you for tuning in to the FA Football Forum. If you like this episode and you want any more information, please visit thefa.com forward slash clubs and leagues or email clubsprogram at thefa.com. If you want a monthly dose of this content, be sure to search the Grassroots Football Hub on YouTube or find In The Box on your favourite podcast provider. This is the podcast supporting grassroots clubs and leagues be the best places to play and enjoy the game.